Okay, uh, so we're going to be talking about uh, questions of state injustice, um, and really there's a lot of different topics under here. Um, there's going to be a lot of things in the discussion page. I know it wasn't working uh, last week uh, as well as it should, um, so uh, not all of you got to uh, kind of post your comments and discussion, that kind of thing, so that should be fixed this week. Um, so make sure that you head over there uh, afterwards. But we're going to give you kind of a big overview picture of some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about. So under this, um, I've kind of grouped together a lot of different things under this category. Uh, it's talking about um, poverty, but also uh, civil uh, injustice, uh, civil disobedience, um, war punishment, secular governance, that, that kind of thing. Just different things that are related to uh, what's under the purview of the state, um, what's part of justice, and what is the Christian response to that. So we're going to look at some of the various different uh, responses to that. Uh, so first off, just some general considerations. Um, the kind of one of the big overarching concerns uh, throughout this is that Christians um, are often citizens of two kingdoms, meaning that they are part of the kingdom of God um, and part of a civil or secular government as well. Um, and throughout Christian history, there's been this kind of assumption that citizenship in the kingdom of God supersedes that of any civil society. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of the different shifts and how those might have gotten merged and, and melded together a little bit. Um, but from earliest Christianity, um, definitely throughout uh, a lot of the Reformation period, uh, and then on into today, um, there's this kind of tension between these two that, that pops up. And whenever that tension pops up, your allegiance is primarily, uh, of course, to the kingdom of God and not to uh, secular governments. Um, when it comes to question of justice, there's also this understanding that there's a higher justice that is going to be administered by God uh, in all of this. So uh, another consideration to keep in mind is that Christians are called to live peaceably um, within a society under governance of a, a civil government um, as far as possible. And there's some different scriptures that talk about this, about praying for the emperor, about seeking the welfare, um, as far as depends on you, live at peace uh, with everyone and that kind of thing. Um, Ultimately, when it concerns to justice, um, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit, but it should be also a big understanding that God is the ultimate king. He's the ultimate ruler. He's the one who is going to make sure that all things are right in the end. Uh, you can go back to like someone like Julian Norwich uh, in the high Middle Ages. Uh, you know, All will be well, all shall be well, all manner of things must be well. Um, that kind of, kind of thought here. All right, so we'll go through a little bit of the history uh, before we start going to some more specific issues. So uh, first off, we're going to look at antiquity. Um, so prior to Constantine, uh, Christianity did not have a favored status within the Roman Empire. In fact, they were often at odds with the Roman Empire. So there's a lot of, like, how are we going to deal with that? And it, there really wasn't a concern of this dual allegiance. You don't really get that dual allegiance talk until after uh, Constantine. Um, because Constantine shifts the status of Christianity away from um, kind of being this you know, persecuted religion to now it being a favored religion, not just tolerated, but favored religion um, within the Roman Empire. And so a lot of the, the old kind of models had to change. And so there becomes a bigger question of well, what is the relationship between the church and the state as far as it's concerned. Um, so... As we read when we were uh, looking at, at Augustine, uh, he talks about a republic as a collection of individuals around a common interest, uh, and that becomes kind of a standing definition. Um, he, he talks about that in the context of there being competing republics, um, but the question arises early on is does the state include shared values and history? Is that a requirement uh, to be a member of a state? Certainly people today become citizens of countries where they don't have a shared history. Um, is the state or the republic is that distinct from people? Um, another view, way to like kind of view republic or view civil governance is that the state is meant to be in service of the people, not the other way around. Um, and you see some of this uh, early on in uh, like Plato's Republic uh, and the early Republic, but that kind of falls away for a lot of the medieval period um, that we're going to get into. Um, early on, you have this understand the state, wherever it is, whatever it's doing, is uh, ordained ultimately by God. So it is under the purview of God, it's part of the plan of God, it's under his, his plan. 
and it's kind of what we call might call pre-medieval times or very early mid Middle Ages. Um, the state was something to which Christians could never really truly belong. Uh, so even after this Constantinian shift, um, with Constantine, he has this whole thing where he delays or puts off his baptism because he believes as you know an officer of the state, he's going to have to do some things that are not Christian. Um, it's really not until Augustine that you start seeing some kind of effort to merge these two together at the very early uh, uh, development. So during the Middle Ages, um, Augustine definitely kind of starts that, but he know is also one of the first ones to notice the tension between these two states, these two citizenships, the kingdom of God and the secular state. Um, after the fall of Rome, uh, the state began to have a little bit more positive view in Christian circles and within the church. Um, despite this, the state is still you know, understood to derive its power from the church during the Middle Ages, it's at least during the European era. Um, that uh, This is where you have the Pope is the one who crowns people. Um, the Holy Roman Empire is kind of under the purview of the Pope and that kind of thing. Um, once you get to the Reformed period, um, especially with someone like Martin Luther, you see the state as, uh, to a certain extent, an instrument of the church. Now, if you start looking at the Swiss Reformation, it to get a little bit more complex, it starts to be a little bit more separation, but there's a, like a mutual beneficence going on there. Um, where this re idea really starts to take off is, um, the, the, this tension idea is after the Treaty of Westphalia. So the Treaty of Westphalia ended the Thirty Years' War um, after the Reformation, which is kind of like the culmination of the wars on religion. Uh, and so what you have happen afterwards is pretty much an agreement that there can be different states that have different religions, um, or in this case it's going to be Protestant versus Roman Catholic, um, and which one is going to be determined by who is over that, that uh, territory. Um, and so the Treaty of Westphalia kind of enshrined this into law that the state is used to uphold whatever the faith community, that citizenship of the kingdom of God that exists within that community, that's meant to protect its people uh, as part of that. Um, once you start getting to the Enlightenment, which follows right after the Treaty of Westphalia, you have uh, different understandings of what the state actually is. So someone like Thomas Hobbes is going to talk about social contract and that um, kind of a natural state of man is that they, they, they are fundamentally, um, I think, nasty, brutish, and short is a lot of times how it's, it's phrased there. Um, Hobbes is not necessarily an exact language, but that, that gets at the gist of it. Whereas Locke wants to talk instead that, no, people are a little bit better than that. In fact, everyone has these fundamental rights. Uh, for Locke, these are going to be life, liberty, and property. Uh, and the, the fundamental role of state is to protect and to promote these rights. So there's some kind of different understandings that are happening. Um, with the, the, some more modern developments, you get uh, kind of this anti-totalitarian stream, and this really happens as a result of the world wars in the middle of the century. Um, what you have happen is, this is the first time um, that you have not just genocide, but genocide on a mass scale. Um, and not just talking about the Holocaust, although that is definitely part of it. We're also talking about the, the programs, um, I mean, there's just there's too many to count, but basically you have systematized, mechanized genocide on a massive scale, and this becomes something of a crisis for state. Um, how are we to understand state when these horrible things happen? Um, this is also the first time that you see anarchy seen as now a more viable option, um, that maybe we can do away with state altogether. Um, this kind of all of this kind of comes to a head with Germany uh, in World War II. Um, where you have documents, and when we get to the discussion uh, page, we'll, we'll be talking about things like the, the Barman Declaration against uh, World War II, uh, the widespread genocide perpetrated by the Nazis, and this idea that there needs to be some way to hold the state accountable. During kind of late Middle Ages, um, you have this idea of the divine right of kings, that you don't really subject king, uh, who's kind of staying in for state, to the same laws and rules that the people have, they're going to answer to God. Well, after World War you, you get early you know, murmurings against this, but definitely after World War II, there becomes an idea that really there needs to be a way to hold a state, in this case it's more republics and that kind of thing, but to hold states accountable. Um, and that's where you start getting things like the League of Nations after World War I, which, which kind of fails, but then the United Nations, um, you know, international uh, courts of justice, 
things like that. There, there are ways that you need to be able to hold uh, nation states accountable to something outside of themselves also. There's also this general idea that the, the universe, um, from a more secular standpoint, the universe uh, favors justice um, as part of that. So kind of moving more into the more explicitly Christian perception of this uh, for the, the Christian ethics class, there are some different attitudes toward the modern state. So on the one hand, you have avoidance, and this is um, a lot of what uh, kind of derives from nonconformist groups, and we're talking specifically, think like uh, some of these Anabaptist groups like the Amish, um, certain branches of Mennonites, um, but there's other groups also that uh, seek to avoid the state. They seek to remove themselves entirely. They don't want anything to do with state. Let us do our thing. You do your thing. We're going to be separate entirely. You also have those who are kind of engaged in rebellion against the state. In fact, this whole idea of civil disobedience is going to feature pretty prominently. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk about this here in a little bit. Um, is revolution acceptable? Are you allowed to overthrow uh, an unjust ruler? And you have, like with someone like uh, Martin Luther, you have this kind of... Um, in between area where it says like you know maybe this is okay but then later on it says no you should not uh, overthrow an unjust ruler um where you have someone like zwingli uh who is, says yeah absolutely um warfare and uh, overthrow of ruler is acceptable um some more modern writers you have people like uh, kavanaugh said that the church exists as a better state uh, that yes you're a member of both states but the church exists as a better state and the role of the Christian is to pull the secular state toward what the church might be. Um, then you have someone like O'Donovan, uh, who we talked about before, uh, but he has this idea of that Christians should participate fully in the state, um, with the idea that they should be working to restore this idea of Christendom, of the Christian state, um, for him. You also have those who say, no, you need to participate fully in the state, uh, but understand that there's still a separation between the secular state and the Christian state. And this is, uh, at least historically, been the view of most Baptists um, and most Baptist groups. Um, but there are other groups that kind of uh, fall in this line as well. You have questions of rights, that the really the Christian perspective is not concerned with rights, but the secular state is concerned with rights. And that's just kind of this back and forth there that the state should exist to uphold my rights including my right to religion but i as a christian uh, living in the kingdom of god are not concerned with my own personal rights um, you also have the idea of that the state needs to temper its justice with mercy and that that mercy comes from a, a definitely a christian perspective to help temper that justice um, and then you have the idea of like i said talking about the, the christian perspective that we do not favor our own rights um, we rely on the state for that, uh, and instead we are going to talk about redemption and reconciliation. So I don't call upon my own right to justice, although the state may have a right to seek its justice, um, but I'm more willing to forgive. And, and, or, and you have this question of, like, should there be a little bit more nuance here? Um, these are just some of the positions. This is definitely not an exhaustive list. Um, getting more into kind of the idea behind of what do we do with an unjust state then? Um, so, different responses to this um, are, well, should we just accept an unjust state? Um, is there a sense in which we should work within the state, within the powers that be, in order to move it towards a gradual change? Uh, and if you know anything about like the debate over the slave trade, especially as it happened in England, this was a big argument. Um, so a, a lot of parliamentarians... Uh, who were opposed to slavery, there was a divide between whether we should work gradually within, uh, which tended to be the more the kind of Scottish position, um, or whether we should have a more radical stance against it. Um, but still working within, so both groups are still working within the state. Um, then you have the, the question of civil disobedience. Um, and so when you start talking about civil disobedience, this is not just disobeying law, this is a pointed disobedience of law for the sake of making a point. A lot of civil, civil disobedience um, in the 20th century is going to draw on the work done by Mahatma Gandhi. Um, you're going to see it's kind of highlighted probably most heavily with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement, is that they know what the law is. It's an unjust law, so they are going to very publicly, very openly violate that law. In this case, um, you know, like the lunch counter sit-ins, um, 
and that sort of thing. But then they're going to also accept what the punishment is for that. Um, the idea that this will draw attention to what is going on. Um, so that's the nonviolent. You also have the idea of targeted violence. And so um, I mentioned the Martin Luther King, which we're going to have some questions about um, in the discussion. But also you have this idea of targeted violence. And so you see this kind of coming out um, with some of the responses to apartheid in South Africa. Is certain targeted violence acceptable? Is extreme violence acceptable? This is kind of where you get more of the liberation theology strain uh, in of like having a much more extreme open violence. Is that acceptable given that there's an unjust state? And that could include all the way up to open rebellion and sedition. Is that acceptable? And this is not just liberation theology. This is a genuine question in like the Reformation as well. So we're going all the way back there. Uh, you can find some questions about what we should do. Go back even further to um, early Christian debates. Uh, there weren't very many, but there were some that argued that the Christian response to the Roman Empire is open rebellion. Um, so these are just different things to keep in mind. Should you flee and just remove yourself from an unjust state? In fact, that seems to be um, some debate about whether uh, Bonhoeffer did the right thing of going back into the state, whether he should have stayed removed from it. Um, the big question comes with revolution is extreme violence, in this case warfare, against a state, is it ever justifiable? Um, I think most Americans would agree that yes, it is. Um, but, you know, as a Christian looking at commands against violence, about turning the other cheek, is this a defensible position? And then why is it a defensible position? Uh, kind of moving on, uh, some of the other reasons that we're going to have are going to deal with the issue of punishment. Usually we're, we're talking specifically about uh, um, capital punishment, death penalty, but this is a much broader term also. So a big part of this has to do with what is the point of punishment? Is it retributive? This idea of retributive justice that, you know, we need to do uh, some, some punishment that's fitting the crime. Does punishment exist solely as a deterrence or primarily as a deterrence for, to dissuade others who might commit the crime? Or is punishment more of this rehabilitation sense? Should we be focused on rehabilitating people back into society? Uh, in which case, how well are we doing that? Um, there are some issues that come up with mandatory sentencing, because this doesn't really leave a lot of room for mercy or mitigating circumstances or that kind of thing. Um, when you have punishment used as a deterrence, you kind of have to begin to question, is deterrence even ethical? Uh, so when I say right here, I mean, is deterrence ethical? Uh, looking at someone like Kant, the second formulation of the categorical imperative kind of highlights that not using other people as a means uh, only, but um, but always as an end. Um, so if you use deterrence, then you tend to be using people's fear as an end for a just society. So is that acceptable? Um, then when it comes to the question of rehabilitation, does rehabilitation even work? Is it possible to rehabilitate people? Are some people just too far gone? Can restoration work? Is this big movement towards what's called restorative justice? Is that something that is even possible? The big questions, like I said, though, do tend to center around capital punishment, and there's some stuff in the briefing about this. Um, first of all, like practical concerns, like it tends to be much more uh, expensive. Uh, there's questions about DNA exoneration and that kind of thing. Um, but also, there's ethical complications on both sides of this equation of capital punishment. There's ethical complications that argue in favor of it, and ones that argue against it. Okay, uh, the next big topic that we're going to be talking about is uh, different views of war and warfare. Um, and so part of this has to do with like what the reality of war is, um, and how well this corresponds to the secular state and the holy kingdom. Like There is warfare, so we have to accept that. Um, but is a state-run warfare ever endorsable by Christians? And certainly in the Middle Ages, you have something like crusades. Are the crusades right or wrong? Um, is there are different types of crusades? So we might just not talk about in those terms, but also like enhancing the culture of another. Um, this you know, like spreading democracy in the early days of like the War on Terror. That was a big thing. Um, is there a crusade of defense of another. Is that acceptable that our cause is just? If the reason for going into World War II was, you know, defense of those who were being attacked during the Holocaust, is that a defensible position? 
This brings up the whole question of just war, whether or not just war is acceptable. Um, so uh, you can have this more uh, systematized approach, like, okay, a just war can be just if your intent is to minimize the overall net amount of harm. That's kind of a more utilitarian approach. You can have a qualified just war, like, well, this would be just provided that X, Y, or Z. Um, you have a lot of discussion around pacifism. In fact, um, is it even practical to be a pacifist? Should this be theologically normative? Is this the only way to understand scripture and that kind of thing? Um, so kind of final thoughts on war, which is where we're going to end up. Are, um, you have to talk about arguments, not just of whether the state can do it, but whether you as a citizen um, should, you know, as a Christian and a citizen are able to participate in war. And there's lots of arguments both in favor and against participating in war. Uh, we're talking about deterrence in the context of punishment, but it carries over into talking about war as well. Um, we also have to talk about different responses for war. Is revolution acceptable? What about war as peacemaking? Instead of talking about just war, should we talk instead about just peacemaking? And what does that look like? Um, talking about the difference between active peace and passive peace. So with active peace, you have this idea of like you are doing warfare to actively promote peace, or the passive peace, you just want cessation of all arms and that kind of thing. Um, and then the final question when we start talking about war is, is there a really default Christian position? Um, so this lecture is a little bit shorter. Uh, that's intentional because there's going to be a lot more stuff in the discussion. Um, so if you haven't, hop on over to the Blackboard. Um, I should have the discussion page fixed and we will go from there.